I can't wait to see what I'm going to say. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I can't either. I wrote this uh, over the course of a month as I cooked. As I cooked everything, I took took shots of it, and um, so all of these have I've done recently. But I put them in there, you know, over time, and so they're going to kind of come up. I, I hope they come up <laughs> in the right order. Thank you, Jonathan, for doing this. Um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, this key component of, of our cuisine uh, because it's difficult to have a really satisfying vegetable accompaniment as a side dish. That it's very difficult to cook vegetables well it's very difficult to keep vegetables fresh and it sure is hard to get them cut well. Even, even cutting them is a big challenge in some cases. So I went out and got a grocery cart literally uh, full of vegetables and I tried to do a couple of things with each one of them. So I'm going to, uh, move back and forth from vegetables uh, to starches and uh, I put potatoes here in in this uh, in this talk and, and please stop me as I as I go along uh, uh, if, if if I say something that is uh, not what you might have expected or if you've had other experiences please let me know so go ahead for the first one please I want to talk about these difficult vegetables called leeks. They are extremely difficult to clean. And I don't care how well you do it. You don't th even think that you can cut a leek up, put it in a colander, run some water over it, and get them clean. You're going to serve sand if you do that. I promise. It's going to be at the bottom of every soup bowl that you, <laughs> that you ladle out. It's just the most difficult. It's grown in sand and it carries the sand all the way into your living room and all the way into that soup bowl. Uh, very difficult to clean. Best way to do it is to cut it into small slices and put it in a great big pan of a deep pan of water and let the sand sift to the bottom and then take them carefully off the top. Don't pour them through a colander. The sand comes right back in there. So I can't stress it enough, and it, it ruins people's meals to, to have the grit from sand in these things. I make a leek and potato soup with only four ingredients, and it is a, a wonderful thing, hearty, so flavorful, with only water, leeks, a little sour cream for garnish, and some potatoes, and that's it. And I know, and this is a soup base, because this, this is the base that you would take on to a, a course to, a, a, you know, a, a more elegant, creamy uh, French style of soup, bisque. And those are all fine. All those bisques are fine and elegant and smooth and great. Uh, but this leek and potato soup should be on your menu without all that cream and butterfat. And it only needs four cups of sliced and carefully washed leeks, four cups of russet potatoes. And I'll go into the potatoes here in a little bit. If you're going to do a vichyssoise, you want to puree this soup and you want to uh, serve it chilled with cream and so forth, a vichyssoise, then you really do want to use russet potatoes. If you use a Yukon potato, you're going to have little potato pebbles in there. It's not going to have the smoothness. So it's important for russets in this particular case. And, and uh, that, that's why I, I'm, I'm saying it's important for your, the texture of your pureed soup. Uh, six cups of water, simmer at 20 minutes. Okay, next one, please. So, so here it is. And... Um, I've cut it, I've washed it, I've cut the potatoes to a uniform size. That's the thing about doneness of vegetables. They all have to be cut to a uniform size so that they're done uniformly, and also they have great eye appeal. So you want 
to spend the extra time cutting the vegetables, whatever they are, to a uniform size. And then you'll have a much more, you'll have uniform texture, you'll have eye appeal, you'll have doneness, really, and nail it. So that's it. Those three ingredients then and, uh, and portion it out and put a dollop of sour cream in there, uh, if you like, because that, that does add another sophistication to this hearty peasant soup. It's delicious. I really recommend leeks. I really want to warn you, though, they're tough to deal with. Okay. Jonathan, do you, do you season that then? Yes, and it doesn't need much more than salt and pepper. Okay. It's just the most earthy and satisfying and ar aromatic soup I can think of. Okay. Hmm. Let's, let's talk about the two, the two big kinds of potatoes, you know, the russets, the starchy ones, um, also called bakers or Idaho's or, or, or any other number of names. But anyway, they're, they're the russet potatoes and we mash them. They're the best ones for mashing. They're the best ones for frying. They're the best ones for baking, of course. And surprisingly, they're the ones for hash browns. You would think that does not be, be the case, but they brown beautifully, whereas the Yukon Gold potatoes don't that brown very well at all. And we always, put, we always peel russet potatoes, unless you're serving them bakers. And my wife's always confused about that. Every time we have potatoes, she says, okay, are these the ones that I can eat the peel or not eat the peel? So, <laughs> so I just tell you, peel them. Uh, those those uh, peels of the russet potatoes are really coarse. Those eyes are ugly and not, not too appealing. The Yukons, now, we roast them. We make lyonnais, lyonnais uh, out of them. We make soup out of them because they hold their shape. We make potato salad and peeling is optional on a Yukon Gold because the skin, especially the small ones, the skin is very tender, very nice. Now, red potatoes are like an El Camino, not a good truck and not a good car. <laughs> they don't work for me. They, there's too many eyes. They don't have the, the wonderful starchiness of the russet. They don't have the creaminess of the, of the gold, Yukon gold. They're just kind of, they, they do have a, an important purpose, and that's in, a, in the European style, French style, German style of potato salads. And that's where you can see that, not peel. Fingerlings are their own species of potatoes. That's... That's a name of a type of potato, and they are odd shape. They're very showy. They we roast them almost always, and um, could be put in a, a pretty elegant potato salad, not peeled. That's oh, I wouldn't want to do that. Their the, their skin is all different colors and beautiful, and you'd want to show that flavor. Not much different than a Yukon Gold. I can't taste any difference. They just look showy, look great on a plate. Very expensive, seasonal, only rarely available. Very short season. New potatoes are different than fingerlings. New potatoes could be anything. Could be Yukon's russets, purple. They could be I don't know, any kind of potato. New potatoes are really showy. We roast them or boil them, not peeled. Again, more for show. We're not getting a lot of flavor. Uh, of these. It's the texture of the potatoes that are different. And the two worlds are starchy for the russet and waxy for, for the Yukon. Let's take a look at perfect use of a Yukon potato. Next, next slide, please. That's Lyonnaise. Lyonnaise. Uh, the, if you take two pounds of Yukon gold potatoes and peel them and cut them, in a thick, pretty thick slices, half an inch thick slices. Put four tablespoons of butter in, in on those uh, sliced potatoes and put a lid on the saute pan. You need some pretty medium high heat. I mean, you need, you need some heat on this or you won't get any browning. 
and turn them every few minutes and through 15 minutes, they will oh, be beautifully God, brown. So uh, beautifully okay. brown. Well, it's a... Uh, but keep them covered. I didn't think it would be home, so... Why is it too hard? Um, then, after 15 minutes, put sliced onion in with them, turn the heat down just a tad, and in 10 minutes, they will have browned beautifully in the pan, luscious, creamy texture. Next slide, please, Jonathan. And there you go. Mm. Now, that is a wonderful second side dish, very aromatic, brown, not crispy. Brown doesn't mean crispy. Um, that's a different thing. But these are so, the browning is for flavor. The crispy is for texture. And so anyway, we really, they're, they're not going to be crispy as you would expect a fried potato to be at all. They take advantage of the characteristic waxiness of the, of the lionese. So very, very, I mean, of the uh, Yukon goals. Sweet onions really add a, a, a nice thing here. This is a great way of, to, do, to do those waxy potatoes. Okay, next slide, please. So now here is the starchy potato, the russet for hash browns. Again, you see I'm cooking in a saute pan over pretty high heat with a little bit of fat and a lid on. Now that's sort of an oxymoron, but I use a lid a lot with a saute pan because it really increases the speed of the cooking. I mean, it, it, it gets things done quickly and without them over browning. And uh, so, for, so for potatoes in a, in a uh, hash browns, they're not going to get done in there when they're beautifully browned. If you don't do this, you're going to have to cook and cook and cook to get the interior of them done. And the exterior is going to either be over brown or stuck to your pan. So Teflon pan, a little bit of shortening. And they're so easy to do this way. You just flip the whole thing over. It doesn't make a difference if you don't get it over. You can turn them over uh, if you're not comfortable doing that by hand, but they brown so nicely. I, I do eggs this way, basted it's called. I, I, I do all kinds of stuff in a saute pan over pretty high heat with a lid. Okay, next one. Next, next slide, please. John. Okay, this is a bunch of bunch of things that I was prepping for uh, one for actually for Coco Vaughn that we're going to talk about next month. A braise of chicken, classic chicken, you know, purple chicken. My kids always call it. And so I had these these things: the onions, the pearl onions, the shallots, the mushrooms, all prepped to do that. And so, but I wanted to show them to you here. Pearl onions are fabulous, very difficult to peel, takes a minute to peel them. Uh, and, and it's hard to get them done. Uh, so here's, here's how I use, here's how I do it. Um, I get them in a, in a small pan with a small amount of oil, and it's a pretty high heat, and it gets some browning on it. It adds a lot to the flavor. And it also starts the cooking process. And it, they'll, they'll brown in there for a few minutes. And then if I'm going to put them in a stew or soup or whatever, then I just take them right out of that pan and drop them into the uh, soup base or the braise and let them cook in there for a long time, 20, 30 minutes. They're, they're really nicely done. And when you bite into them, you will think that you have some kind of exotic and excellent vegetable. You won't have tasted this taste. Uh, it, it's, it's quite unusual. It's quite different than a, a Vidalia or any other kind of onion or even a shallot. I mean, it's just really distinctive and delicious. The shallots, we don't use enough. Uh, they're always at the grocery store and you just walk right by there because we just don't seem to use them as much as I think we should. They are wonderful. And um, I heartily recommend them. They stay a long time in, the, in a, uh, your dark pantry. Uh, 
they they last a long, long time, and you can just bring them out when you need them. Keep a few on hand. They're great in salads, great in potato salads, great in uh, in all kinds of ways. And in this particular case, I sauteed those shallots uh, for a few minutes in a little butter, and then I put the mushrooms in on that. And that's what I serve mushrooms with a, as a side dish for grilled meat. Now look at my mushrooms there. Um, these are just plain old domestic mushrooms. Oh, I lost my picture. What have I done? Um, there. Those are just domestic mushrooms, but it didn't cut them the same old way we always see them, you know, straight down. Um, you get all different size pieces when you do that that way. Tiny little pieces and great big pieces. They don't cook evenly. They don't look very good either. So if you'll just quarter them on a great big one, cut them in sixths, they're all the same size. And they cook and the same all the way through uniformly. They look good. And they're bite size. So I recommend that. Um, when you cook them, saute them with garlic and shallots, and season them, set them aside and keep their jus that they have rendered out. And be sure to add that to with them into your sauce because it's marvelous flavoring. Don't you don't want to lose that that juice. Okay, next slide, please. Green beans, very difficult to cook. Very and in the case of Heracote vert, very difficult to find. Uh, our culinary team used frozen ones for practices, and they were excellent. And I really recommend it. If you can find a, a good brand of Heracote vert frozen, go for it. Because finding them fresh is very short season, very difficult to find. And they, they will be... Uh, very difficult to find that are not uh, past their season. Uh, so watch out. And green beans are a big deal right now. They're very difficult. Uh, everybody, uh, all the restaurants and everything are having a hard time with green beans. Uh, not only is it because it's late in the season, just because some of these crops have just totally failed. Uh, so green beans are older, tougher, different totally. They've got a different name. Blue Lake, is it? Lenny? Something like that. I think it is the name of the, or, or our green beans, our domestic green beans. Um, so let's, let's cook green beans. <laughs> and that's a technique The next, I think the next slide describes that blanching. We blanch all kinds of vegetables, you know, you pre-cook them, par-cook them. Most of the time it involves uh, cooking them to the, just the right degree of doneness and then shocking them or cooling them quickly or in some way or another, stopping the cooking. And then we hold them until service and then just saute them with butter and salt and pepper and garlic and so forth. So blanching a green bean. Now, my, I, I grew up with a, a dreadful cook. Uh, my mother, a dreadful cook, a wonderful mother couldn't cook anything. So it, I had no experience uh, with well-cooked green beans until I became an apprentice at Johnson County Community College. And John Joyce taught me about the doneness that's that's right for vegetables. But a green beans should not be flat. <laughs> uh, so how you, how you do, how you cook it to the perfect degree of doneness and all kinds of other vegetables is to blanch it. Lots of boiling water, lots of water. And while that's going, then you stem and you trim all the vegetables. We like to leave that, that cute end on green beans. Many, some people don't, but you certainly have to trim each and every green bean uh, to, to get the brown off uh, and make the, in, the cut in look fresh. So every single bean has to be handled. So once the water is boiling rapidly and all of them are trimmed and you plunge them into this water and they shouldn't, it shouldn't come off its boil. There should be enough water there that it keeps boiling. 
And for about 10 minutes, nothing happens. They start to pop and it's a crazy thing, a big pot of boiling green beans. Great aroma and lots of action and lots of noise. Uh, so they about 10 minutes. And once you get it 10 minutes on them, then you got to start this tasting process. You're going to eat a lot of raw green beans. The first experiences you're going to have at 10 minutes is the bean is going to crunch. It should not crunch. You should not hear your neighbor eating green beans. <laughs> and if you go to Bones, what is it? Bonefish Grill, you get raw green beans every night. No kidding. Crunchy green beans. That's they they serve it that way. <clears throat> the second thing that happens after a few more minutes is the green beans squeak, literally squeak. You can hear the squeak. Still not done. The next thing that happens, and it's really a precise moment, they achieve what chefs call crisp tender. And that is just to the a little resistance. And then you got to get them out of that water quickly, go into a colander, and then very just as quickly into a huge ice bath to shock them. That sets their tent, their beautiful color, and it stops the cooking. And now you can keep store them for two or three days and bring them out in batches and, and just saute them with butter and salt and pepper, and you'll serve perfectly done green beans. Okay, next slide, please. I have lately come to love romaine, but it's very labor intensive. You're used to, like I am, a bag of fresh spinach or a bag of, of you know, spring mix or something. It's all washed RTU, ready to use. It's, uh, it, you know, it's all, it stays fresh for a few days, uh, but it, it's, it doesn't stay fresh for very long. Mm -hmm. I, I just so often lose spinach. A bag of spinach sometimes comes in and I can't even use it. I just toss it. Um, it, it. Once you open it, it really goes fast. So, uh, so it's hard to keep lettuce here in the house. And so I have turned to romaine hearts. Not that great, big, ugly giant heads of romaine, they, there's so much waste there and so much dirt and all that. But the romaine hearts have a lot better usage. And I really recommend it. It stays fresh for a long, long time in your refrigerator. Uh, it's, it's very uh, nutritional green as opposed to iceberg with hardly any nutritional value. Um, it's crisp. This is not a butterhead lettuce like you know, the elegant ones. Uh, this is a crisp head lettuce. And so it has a lot of nice crispness and it's very darn flavorful. It's so surprisingly flavorful. We usually pour Caesar dressing on it and you, you forget about how good the, the lettuce is, but this is really a good lettuce. I really recommend it. If you'll do one thing and that is cut that stem out. It's a lot of water and, and it's not flavorful. If you give, I saw a, a, a Facebook thing the other day of a pet beaver. Somebody had a pet beaver and they were feeding the beaver romaine leaves. And guess what? He ate it like a corn on a piece of corn on a cob and <laughs> left, left that stem. He knew it wasn't good. <laughs> so do that and wash it. Those bags look like they're uh, ready to use. They're not. Uh, they, they say packed in the field. And that's a clue for you that there's grits, grit and other critters in there. So I'm going to show you a salad, I think here made with, and you can, okay, you can see there on the left, how it appears so much differently. If you take that core out, it's a dark green, crisp, delicious lettuce. I recommend it. Okay. Next slide, please. And there's a, there's a chicken Caesar with that romaine. And um, so I really uh, recommend uh, romaine for you as your daily, every day, you gotta have, want to have lettuce in the refrigerator ready, ready to pull out at any time. Uh, I want to talk about tomatoes here because um, we're in the season. I, we drive all the way up north to Smithville. That's a long drive for us. 
uh, to get tomatoes. We've been doing it for nine years. We go to a, to a um, roadside stand. The guy goes to Jamesport all the way up on the Iowa line uh, and gets his tomatoes from Amish growers and they really do them right. So for the whole summer up until mm. up until October, we have one of the, some of the best tomatoes we've ever had. And um, so I, I buy them once a week or so and um, I usually keep the first day I have them. If they're not soft, if they're firm, uh, I keep them out on the counter for a day, sometimes two. But if they're the least bit soft, into the refrigerator they go, and it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I, there's, there's have so much flavor that they handle well from the refrigerator. So now once the season's over, I won't buy another tomato till next year. And I can go back to my friend in Smithville and buy his Amish tomatoes because anything that you buy at the grocery store, unless, unless you have a really great grocer and produce market within that grocer, you're going to be buying tomatoes that are brought up on a truck, green as a gourd, to Kansas City or somewhere close by. And they're going to be put in a big container overnight. They're green as and hard as my tabletop. And they're going to be put in this big container overnight with ethylene gas, which turns them pink or red. They're still a raw, I mean, there's still a green tomato they just happen to be turned artificially paint or red so don't do that just don't buy those those winter out of season yeah. tomatoes they bring them up here green because they can pack them in a big box and they don't squish themselves no it, it, those are not edible buy canned tomatoes they are you know, Lydia recommends canned tomatoes to make her sauce. She that's what she insists on mm -hmm. for for her marvelous tomato sauce. They're canned, mm -hmm. and so buy those. Um, okay, I, 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 let's let's go on. Uh, that's that's about tomatoes. Here's summer squash. They are very. Let let me say insipid, <laughs> prosaic. They're bland. They're no better than the herbs and seasonings you can put on them because uh, they just don't have a lot of flavor. They're nice and pretty, always available, but they really need bold seasoning. And um, I just want to mention quickly that dried herbs are a very good thing as long as you give them a chance to, uh, to reef. More, you know, in, in moisture so that they can release their flavors or heat, moisture or heat. Um, if you put uh, fresh herbs in things, their flavor is so volatile that it'll all be gone. We made a tomato basil soup, or one of our culinary teams, I think the first culinary team that went to international competition, and they, they had a, a basil tomato soup on, on the menu that was a uh, just wonderful thing. And years later, I, I had students who were doing it for one of our luncheons. And I told them, don't you put that basil into the soup until right at the last minute. And of course, I got, they got away from me and, and they did. And we had a nice flavored tomato soup, but no one knew that it was tomato basil because the flavor was gone. Okay. So Here's, see how nicely cut those are. They all look great and they're bite size and they cook the same. So here, here's how to do that cut. You don't want coins of zucchini. You'll have tiny little pieces, big, you don't want coins of anything. You don't want coins of carrots. You don't want coins of cucumbers. This coins are just a bad shape because they're all going to be different sizes. Okay, next slide, please. So how do you, how do you cut this? You can see from the picture on the top right that I've taken the zucchini, washed it very carefully, cut the, cut the ends off, and then cut it in half. And then I cut it in that in, into halves. So I've got a fourth. And then I put my knife on a bias and I cut all of those seeds out. 
and there is the piece there with a the flat, with the flat side mm -hmm. where the seeds were. Okay, and turn that over, cut that on the bias, and and it's wow, voila, it's a nice a nice cut for a round long vegetable that makes it bite size, looks good, cooks nicely. And again, here I am sauteing pretty high heat, garlic, dried herbs, olive oil, and I'm sauteing with a lid on. Um, it, it's only on for a couple of minutes, but it gets the vegetable to the right doneness, which is again, with some texture, not mushy. And if I had the lid off and was just sauteing in the traditional manner, I have to cook it for a long, long time to get it done inside. I mean, it's the browns and, and the pan scorches and all that stuff, but just a couple of minutes with the dome on the, with, with the pan. So I had two sizes of, of lids that I use on my saute pans often, uh, which helps things get done quickly without getting overdone on the outside. Okay, next slide. I like to make these uh, gratins of, of uh, zucchini. Um, and, but I have to tell you, it's just but ugly. I, it just, it's just an ugliest dish. And, and my wife always says, what is this? <laughs> so I dress it up a little bit with a little ramekin and put the breadcrumbs and the cheese over the top of it. And it, it helps the appearance a lot. And she says after the first bite, oh, oh, this is good. This is good. <laughs> but the appearance just puts us off. I'm sorry that I don't know any way to make it prettier. We're making uh, here uh, uh, veluti, veluti. And that is one of the classic, we made five classic sauces uh, always in professional kitchens. And this one is a chicken or vegetable base sauce that's thickened with flour. So here it is, we've got three tablespoons of butter and three tablespoons of flour and a couple of cups of vegetable stock. Well, guess what? The zucchini really does render out a lot of great vegetable juice. So just use that and, and uh, make this nicely thickened sauce and then shred the and squeeze the zucchini, keep, keep, you don't have to seed it in this case, and then keep that juice, saute the, uh, the shallots and the zucchini together and uh, put them in a casserole, breadcrumbs, pour the sauce over the top of it, cheese, brown it, delicious, <laughs> a delicious thing, but you have to serve it in a neat little ramekin of some sort for the presentation. So go ahead to the next one there. You'll see, you'll see, um, Next slide, please, Jonathan. Thank you. So there's a there's the zucchini, and you can see how much zucchini juice that this amount uh, rendered. Um, and I squeezed the heck out of it through the, the zucchini in over the the colander down into the pan and saved all that. And I made the made the sauce, and it was pretty, isn't it? Green, a <laughs> green velouté. And then uh, that's what I went into the casserole with. So, okay, next slide. Here we're going to talk about hard winter squash, and I'm, I mean, they they earn their name. Some of these, like the butternut squash, are uh, humbling, difficult, dangerous to peel and cut. Cut. I mean, really dangerous it's it's one of those vegetables that's very very intimidating for me and i've done this professionally so i'm telling you that the butternut squash is a hard thing to peel um, i make two meals out of it i'll show you what they are um to to dip, because it's two different vegetables it's so strange it has a pumpkin shape at the bottom and then it's solid uh, squash on the top part. So I cut it there. Uh, I like to use uh, butternut squash for soup. It's a luscious soup and I like to roast them for fall vegetables. And uh, now the, the acorn squash, 
much easier to handle. You don't even have to peel them. I don't, we don't peel them anymore. We just cook them and then, then you can just pull the peel off. It's just a piece of cake. So they're, they're nice. And uh, in that regard, uh, they are not quite as flavorful, in my opinion, as the butternuts. So I like the butternut for its taste. And I like the acorn because they're so easy to do. And you can make them delicious too. Okay, let's, let's go to the next one, please. So here's roasted fall vegetables. And it's just, a, it should be a mainstay on every table uh, all through the fall. Carrots, potatoes, which one would we use? Would we want to use a starchy potato? No, we want one to keep its shape. So we're going to use Yukon's. Um, butternut squash. Uh, rutabaga is a controversial one. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Onions, certainly. Pearl onions would be great here. I mean, boiling onions would be great. Not pearl, not the tiny little ones, but the boiling onions would be terrific uh, in this dish. Um, and turnips, which are just wonderful. And whole garlic cloves peel in here, make an herb oil, uh, roast them for 50 minutes or an hour, and start checking doneness with a paring knife. The hardest thing to cook in here is probably going to be the rutabaga. Um, the uh, carrots take a long time. The potatoes don't take so long. So these things take a long time. And uh, you may you may see that. Well, anyway, there you go. And paring knife tender. And if you have a good herb oil uh, with paprika and dried herbs, this is going to be a very aromatic dish and very and pretty. I think it's pretty. Okay, next next slide, please. Here they are. Here, here I am trying to peel a uh, butternut squash. I have a one serious peeler. Look at that thing. That is that is heavy duty stainless. Uh, really dangerous peeler to handle. Don't don't even try it with this regular peeler. It'll just break. You'll break your peeler trying to get that that hard uh, peel off of that butternut squash. But that serious peeler I have does the job pretty well. Um, so the bottom of the of the acorn squash is surprising when you cut your first one because it's full of seeds, just like the squash are. The, the top we set aside. And so there you go, scoop the seeds out, cut it, roast it, and, and it's a marvelous thing, roasted like that. Okay, next slide. Now, the, second, the top part of the butternut squash after we got it peeled, we cut it into uniform pieces. Really important here, again, for the same reason, we want it to cook evenly. We don't want pieces to be mushy and the other pieces to be hard. You'll have bad texture in your puree. But if you do, and there's no recipe for this particularly, um, say two quarts of peeled, uh, diced butternut squash, throw in a stalk of celery, a carrot, a couple of potatoes, and cook them away in vegetable stock or even chicken stock, if you like, 30 minutes and then, and then puree them. Now, I have done every kind of puree method around Cuisinart's Moulin Mills, the old French classic thing. Uh, we've, we've used potato ricers. I, we, we've done everything, but uh, believe me, unless you unless you really do have a big, powerful Cuisinart, the best thing are these stick blenders. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. marvelous. They're powerful. Uh, and interestingly, and I was going to talk about this uh, before I saw it, but I think it's this month's Consumer Reports that rates them. And uh, the, the mm -hmm. one that they highly recommend is the Cuisinart, and it's very... It's very reasonably priced, thirty, forty dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really, if you don't have one of these, because you puree right in the pot that you're cooking in, you don't have to have all the strainers and all the mess. It's just great, <laughs> and I use it all the time. Okay, so anyway, you puree that. Now, again, this is a soup base. Many, many chefs, my son included, he cannot serve. He doesn't think he can serve 
leek and potato soup without turning it into a creamed bisque. He didn't think that he can serve butternut squash without an equal mm -hmm. amount of heavy cream. But believe me, next slide, please. So believe me, this is delicious. Mm -hmm. and all you need is uh, those, th those vegetables cooked, pureed, Add the dollop of sour cream if you like, uh, and we do. Um, that's a marvelous soup, and it's worth the effort of peeling the doggone butternut squash to to have that soup. It's it's a real pleasure. Uh, okay, next one, John. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, before you move on, and maybe you have this, but I had to go look it up in my my cookbook. Um, I have John Joyce's. Sweet potato hash recipe. Uh, Do you have that one? It has sweet potatoes, carrots, and turnips. That wonderful. is, I know, it's just it was shredded, maybe cooked like hash browns. Um, no, actually cubed, diced. Oh, um, the carrots, the turnips, and the sweet potato diced, and then it has basil, chicken stock, and of course with John, it has cream, um, salt and pepper, and bacon. Okay. Um, I make that a lot, the sweet potato hash. My family Perfect. loves that. Perfect. That's a take mm -hmm. on, uh, on, on the roasted uh, vegetables. I, I right. love we, we often get into a tradition with these things like the acorn squash. Everybody puts those darn fall spices you know, that are fine in a latte, uh, but they make, they turn it into pumpkin and sweet yeah. candy. And, yeah. and uh, it's just so common. You see acorn squash cooked with brown sugar and butter so often, yeah. cinnamon, that that's all you can think of. But mm. honestly, these vegetables stand really well on their own, as John was showing us from that recipe right there. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> idea. Uh, the acorn squash, now, I cut it this way. If you cut it on the sideways, you get these rounds, but they're all different sizes. There you go. They're all different sizes. This way, they're all the same size. They all cook the same, um, and they peel so easily. So don't even bother to cook. I cut it in the little groove there. And uh, that way you don't lose a whole lot. If you try to peel these, you're going to lose a lot of, uh, of mm -hmm. that's under, under those grooves, difficult to peel. We turn them uh, with a turning knife, but that's a very hard skill and it's <laughs> very hard squash and I don't recommend it. Just cook them, cook them away. Great fall color. Okay, next slide. And here, here they are roasting. Oops, I got, got it out of order. Here's a rutabaga. It's a very, very difficult thing to peel and even more difficult to cut where it's easier to peel than a butternut squash, but it's harder to cut. This, is, this vegetable is just dense as it can be, very difficult to cut. And you get a lot of waste. What turns, what is great big looking rutabaga, you're down to half that size by the time you get the fibrous outside off of it and, and get it down to, a nice even texture. Uh, it, it takes a long time to cook. The aroma is very strong. I mean, <laughs> unpleasant to many people. I think it is more unpleasant than cabbage. And wow. uh, so I'm saying a rutabaga is a great thing. It's a great vegetable. It's very, very complimentary of potatoes. Uh, I mean, of uh, par uh, parsnips Where's and it? turnips. But it's hard to cut, and the flavor is so strong, and the cooking time is so very long. So this is, if you love the flavor, good, go for it. Otherwise, stick with the turnips, much, much easier to handle. Mm -hmm. And so I don't personally like the sweetness of parsnips, and I hardly ever use them. So it's just kind of unpleasantly sweet to me. I don't, I don't like them. Go ahead, uh, please, John. Yeah, here, the, here back to the acorns. Um, I, I peeled some of them and uh, roasted them and I left some with the peel on and roasted them. And you can't tell the difference uh, looking, looking at them after we get them out of them. 
I roast them on foil uh, and or right on the pan, not on, as I read many places, they say parchment paper, but they won't brown on a darn parchment paper. It's easy cleanup, but no, I, I want them brown, browning as they're roasting. And I want to season them boldly, garlic and herbs, not brown sugar. And then I serve them with the, with the wonderful spaghetti squash. And the two flavors just really are marvelous together. So let's do, I think the next one is the spaghetti squash which is easy. You don't have to peel it. You just cut it in half. That's a little bit threatening because uh, they're so big and hard. That's watch your watch cutting them to do it safely. You just split them, take the seeds out, roast them until they're just a little soft. You don't want to go too mushy. You don't because they won't separate into the strands like they do here. So at 35 minutes or so, start feeling it. And then, and then just as it starts to get a little soft on the outside, then you know you're done. Get them out. I, I put a heat glove on, go to town, shred them, and get, get them to stop cooking. So just get them shredded and, and spread out and cool down. And then I think that they really do, they really are enhanced. If you keep with the Italian look of them you know they look like spaghetti so treat them like spaghetti in my opinion with italian seasonings and olive oil and great cheese and they're really really a nice side dish and they keep in the refrigerator after they're cooked for several days so you don't have to eat them all at once okay next slide i like those spaghetti squash um, i want to go ahead I was just going to say with the um, butternut squash, when we make that same, same as you do without adding cream, cumin is so good in that. Mm, it is. Yeah. I, yes. I, I had not thought of that, but absolutely. I, I like the idea of those Mexican Southwestern style mm -hmm. of flavors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking, I often think of cumin in uh, New Mexico uh, cuisine, the cuisine of New Mexico, which is different than anything I've ever experienced. So our trips to New Mexico, I really did love the food and they use a lot of cumin. And so the, the butternut squash, really, it's good. See, we're staying away from cinnamon yeah. and allspice and right. brown sugar. That's fine in its season but uh but these things are better i think with italian mexican uh curries and those sorts of things these squash hold up to those bold herbs and then there's then your guest is surprised uh rather than uh, getting kind of a trite thing with the sweet so while i was doing all these things uh cooking all of these things i i hit upon a way to clean my microwave and i've got to share it with you because it's a it's the <laughs> best trick i've learned in a long time i made a crazy mixture a cup of water a couple of lemon slices some baking soda and the vinegar and i microwaved that in a in a in a bowl in the microwave for five minutes don't open it leave it leave the the, the door shut and let it steam in there for a while and then literally you can just wipe this stuff out, anything, any kind of residue. Uh, you can use that liquid as your, uh, as your polishing agent and it smells great. Yeah. And then, uh, so my microwave is cleaner than it has ever been because of this crazy trick. I didn't, you know, it's hard to reach for me. Uh, I'm six feet tall and that, and yes, it's very difficult to clean them the sides and the top of, of the microwave and I put it off and I put it off because it's so difficult to do. And, uh, but that, there you go. There's a trick that worked really, really well for me. <laughs> let's, I, I, that's what I wanted to cover. Um, I didn't, I didn't um, talk about asparagus. 
which is a, a love of mine. I love asparagus when I can find it uh, in big, big diameter asparagus. Mm -hmm. I especially love because the small diameter asparagus doesn't get peeled, which I think is essential. And so it's usually mush in the middle and tough on the outside at the same time. How could asparagus be both tough and mush? It's because the peel doesn't cook at the same rate at the inside. And so, but on the big asparagus, you can really do, do it right by peeling it all the way up to the top. People say uh, to br break it or something and it will break where it's tender or something. I'm not sure how that it, it exactly is. I don't do, I don't believe that. I peel the whole darn thing and I cook the whole thing in, in boiling water until it's just done. And then again, just like we were blanching green beans, plunge it into ice water to stop the cooking at the just the right degree of doneness. And uh, what, a, what a wonderful and showy vegetable it is. It's just, I don't get it when I can't get it big enough to do that process of peeling and then blanching. Uh, otherwise, I, I can't ever find, I can't find asparagus to my taste because the tough outer skin ruin, ruins it for me. So that's, that's I, I, I guess I walk through the grocery store and I buy vegetables that are just right in ripeness or freshness. And I run home and cook them as quick as I can to stop that ripening and to hold them fresh for a day or two until we, we eat them. And so it, it's very hard, very hard. Uh, keeping potatoes uh, around the house uh, for very long, very difficult, unless you have a, a cool, cooler place than your kitchen and dark. Because if you try to leave them out on a the counter, they're going to start sprouting and that's and you don't want potatoes to be sprouting uh, too much of that i used to know the the technical name of the part of the of the potato that's turning green it's got chlorophyll in it. too much of that is uh, not good for you so you don't want those and so you need a dark place to store your vegetables and and um lettuce is difficult to keep all of these things and so i buy what i'm gonna be able to cook right away and don't try to store it the squash will stay on the shelf for a while uh not, not so much the acorn but the butternut squash it'll stick around for a long time they're pretty hardy onions i almost always buy a sweet onion a vidalia texas sweet some kind of sweet onion but uh, when I when I don't get it, then I I do the the Mexican the salsa mexicano. Uh, we call it pico de gallo, but Rick Bayless uh, tells me that Mexicans don't call it pico de gallo. That's the that's the size of the of the little dice things. That's the the bird peck, isn't that a rooster pecks these little bits? And that's they're describing the size. They're not describing what this is. Instead, it's salsa mexicano because of the colors of the Mexican flag. So Rick Bayless says for the onions for, for salsa mexicano, you want to use a white onion, not a yellow onion. And then he describes a process that the Mexicans call deflaming the onion. That is, they, they put the white onion under running water and in a strainer and wash it off. And I do that. And that helps. That helps a lot. Because sometimes it just, that's just a, really the white onion is just too overpowering, but it helps a lot to deflame it, chop it, wash it. It smooths it out quite a lot. But it, the, the Vidalias and the other sweet onions are better for that to my taste. So that's what I usually prefer. So I thought next time 
I would talk about fall braises. Uh, I spoil some of my uh, thunder today talking about the two soups, but I'll talk about uh, some, uh, some classics, uh, beef burgundy, uh, cocoa van, maybe um, some, some other uh, classic soups and, uh, and so forth, if you'll have me back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. I, okay. it, I, I enjoy this. Uh, and um, my, my son and I just had this big discussion about bisques. And, you know, I told him I was, I was doing the, the uh, squash soup and he said, yeah, oh yeah, bisque, great. I said, no, man, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> And he had just served it. Not he works at he works at uh, senior living facility down in Ural's neck of the woods. And and uh, I said you ought to try it without the without the cream and the roux. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's there's my uh, my email. Please uh, contact me, or text me uh, uh, with questions and with comments and things you'd like to you'd like to talk about uh, that are favorites of yours. So very good. Can I very good. The super can I ask a super quick question? Of course. I'm, this is Teresa Ilton. When I go to the store to pick out acorn squash or spaghetti squash, can you give me some guidance as to how to know I'm picking out the ripe or proper ones? Right. The, the texture of the peel on the acorn squash will go soft. You'll be surprised. Pick them up, and if they're waxy, shiny on the peel, they're good to go. It, the color doesn't seem to make any difference. You'll have some orange spots and so forth. That's fine. But the texture of the peel will tell you if the squash is, uh, is on the way downhill. They'll start to get a little wrinkly uh, and so forth. So I think that's, that's a key indication. Uh, the butternut squash, if it's hard, it's, it's good. Uh, and it just seems to really last a long, long time. They buy them er early and store them there in the grocery store and they stay there for months. So, and how, and how about the spaghetti squash? Same as the acorn? Yeah. Again, the, it's the texture of the outside. They should be very firm. No bruises, no cuts. Uh, that would be an indication if something, if, if the, the spaghetti squash peel is pretty tender and if they get roughed up in the in the case they could be uh cut and exposed inside and that would they would not last very long but so but if a nice uniform hard uh texture on all three of those they're fine uh, okay thank you now the rutabaga that one can fool you because it's coated in in paraffin uh is that wax wax i think and um, that they can be spoiled under that wax and you not know it until you get them home and your potato bin is smelly. Oh boy, do they smell bad. And you think when you look at them uh, that they're, they're okay, but they're not. So check out those really big. They're, they're Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. One more thing on doneness. My, my fruit stand guy, I give him everything and say, okay, I want to eat this cantaloupe tomorrow. And he can feel the stem of the cantaloupe uh, and tell me when it would last on the counter for a couple of days or when we need to eat it right now. He's great with peaches that same way. He'll say, eat these right now uh, or don't eat these right now. You give them a couple of days. And he's great with uh, watermelon. I didn't, I didn't ask him about a watermelon the other day. I just grabbed it and ran and uh, got home and threw almost half of the watermelon away because it's so mushy. Um, he, he would have been able to thump it in here and he makes his living doing this. So uh, he, uh, any, anything that he has to throw away that's spoiled uh, is out of his pocket. So he'd be very careful not to buy produce from the Amish that are spoiled and and because it's going to be in his truck for a few days and so yeah, he, he's really good about that I, I told him I always thought you could tell a ripe water uh, cantaloupe uh, from the aroma and he said yeah I've heard that 
but it didn't believe it. <laughs> it's the it's the feel around the stem that is his indication of rightness. So, Ooh. so trust trust these uh, vegetable uh, guys at the vegetable stands because they they know doneness, uh, rightness, mm -hmm. and they'll give you a good recommendation. So, oh, so good to talk to you and to see you all is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you next month.